Oh, cool. All right, so that's one, two. All right, Bill. So we'll just go back into chatting. So, um, Bill Duff, longtime friend of mine and um, co-host of Human Weapon. We're gonna do that again because I this as I hear this in my headset, it's like a one second delay, so it's it's fun. Um, so, a good friend of mine, Bill Duff, co-host of Human Weapon, here with us today on our first podcast. Bill, it's been like four minutes since we spoke. Yeah, it's uh, great to speak to you again after four minutes. What's been going on, Jason? And not a lot. We're just trying to get these headsets working and getting the kinks out of the podcast, man. But um, people always ask me that, like, do you still talk to Bill? And uh, my answer is always like, no, dear God, no. Why? Yeah. <laughs> I get I get very similar questions. It's like, hey, who's the little guy? Where's he at? I go, first of all, he's not little. He's bigger than you. In most cases, people speaking to me, you're bigger than they are. I go, secondly, he's doing great. He's down in Florida, you know, doing his thing and raising kids just like the rest of us. Oh, yeah, that's crazy. It's crazy to think that, like, I'm now a parent. Ugh, that's insane. Life I goes remember quick. a Jason Chambers that told me never, no way in a million years would I ever. And now look at it. I know. Well, you know alcohol does amazing things to life decisions so <laughs> but um so uh, how did you before you get into the the entertainment industry you you have a, a lush and and long football career you played with peyton manning at ut right yeah i played football uh ut with peyton we were captains on the 97 sec championship team and then um he had a little bit better of a pro career than i did i <laughs> <laughs> it's Peyton Manning. Years, he had a little bit of a better career than everybody just about. Right. So don't, it wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, no, I pull for him. He's a good friend of mine. Obviously, I love to see all the success that he had and is having. Um, but then, you know, I moved on to um, eight years of NFL, NFL Europe, XFL, Arena Football League. Then I got hurt really bad and decided to hang it up. And um, it's tough when you hang up football and you don't know what's going to happen. Like, no one says, hey, after football, do this. It's just, uh, you know, the practices are gone, the crowds are gone, the contracts are gone, and you're kind of lost looking for something to do. And um, the movie Invincible was getting ready to, to uh, start filming. So I got a call from a guy, and he said, hey, I know you're done playing, but, you know, we always use ex-NFL, AFL guys for this. And they were filming in Philadelphia, which is where I lived. So they're like, you know, come out and try it. So I went out and tried it. I uh, did that for like three, four months. Um, it was awesome. Great experience. Met some producers and they were like, hey, man, you should try to audition for something. And uh, I was like, yeah, I, I just don't. I didn't really see myself as like a Mark Wahlberg type guy. You know, I looked at him and saw what he looked like and Greg Kinnear and those guys. And obviously I didn't fit that that box. Um but I also was like, all right, you know, why not? I'll give it a go. So the first audition I saw was on Craigslist. It was, you know, ex-professional athlete or professional athlete. Um, must be willing to travel anywhere and fight anybody at any time or something like that, right? I was like, oh, this, this can't be real. Um, I made some phone calls and found out it was and sent in an audition tape. And I think, you know, you know the rest of the story. It's pretty crazy as far as the audition went. Um, yeah, I mean, most real auditions don't come through the casual encounters sections, like on Craigslist. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, that tends to be some shady dude, like inviting you to his loft in New York for his right. private movie. Um, but yeah, no, I found it in a similar way. It was on the uh, MMA Underground, which is this MMA website um, that was really popular back in the day before social media was out. And I saw it just sitting there like that, a similar casting, looking for someone with martial arts experience and this and that. And Drew Fickett was in the UFC see the time and he was living with me and like we gave uh honestly like no real um no real credit to it we just taped ourselves while we were like folding laundry he interviewed me i interviewed him and we kind of sent it off and it was like well that's that thing that's that's not gonna be a, a real thing that's ever going anywhere because you know like auditions don't don't come from that but so you saw it on craigslist and you were like oh yeah that's that's they're looking for crazy i can get crazy pretty much um yeah i mean then the audition with the first two people I ran into were Lieben and Koscheck at the hotel in the elevator. And I thought they were going to have a fist fight right there. Uh, of course they had no idea who I was and I'm giant compared to those guys. So I just was like, guys, 
you know, this is not going to happen with me in the elevator. <laughs> so I just made this, sure they knew that. You see this crazy ad that they're looking for someone to travel the world and fight people and you're married. How does the wife <laughs> feel about this? Uh, well, she, she kind of traveled the world with me before that with football. So it wasn't that different for her. Um, just different ways of getting bumps and bruises. Yeah. Different ways to get bumped and, and hurt. You know, she was always kind of my, my nurse. I'd go out and get messed up and come back and she'd nurse me back to health and then go out and do it again. So it was pretty normal for us. I know that sounds awful, uh, but it, it, it is the truth, you know, and I actually found the physical, the, the fighting aspect and the training aspect of the human weapon a lot easier than I found some of the production side of it. Um, obviously, because we were traveling, and I didn't fit in a lot of places, which was hard for me. And uh, especially in the bedrooms in like Tokyo, it just wasn't a lot of fun for a big dude. <laughs> Bill Duff not fit in places in Tokyo bedrooms. That should be a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so um so what's yeah. that experience like for you where your wife where you go out you do the audition you come back you know we we shot the thailand thailand episode and then didn't hear anything for like god forever right i mean it was several months and then they finally say hey they're gonna make a tv show and you guys are gonna get beat up i had instant regret <laughs> yeah i i actually had uh kind of moved on i thought it was over because it, it was had taken such a long time and I called the production company a couple of days before they greenlit it and said, hey, I'm getting ready to take this job. Um, so, like, I don't know what you guys are thinking, but you, you probably need to find somebody else. And I don't know if that had any influence on I doubt it did. But um, so you, you know, basically later, called the History Channel and you were like, look, I got shit to do. What's going on? I guess basically, no, I had already told, uh, you know, I had already told the company that I was taking the job, basically. And um, they after they called back and said, hey, we're going to do this thing. I was like, you know what? You know, when am I ever going to get this opportunity again? And, you know, my my age was kind of ticking up there. So I said, you know what the hell? Let's give it a go. And I'm really happy that I did. It's one of the best experiences in my entire life. Um, it, you know, I, am sure you can say the same thing. I would have never done that if not for the human weapon. Uh, and it was also some of the worst experiences of my life, you know, going to the killing fields and seeing that mess and um, some of the other stuff we did. It was just really, really educational and eye opening for me. What was your biggest takeaway overall from having uh, the experience of being on the show? Um, I think it really opened my view that. America is not the only free country in the world, um, which, you know, I'm an American and I love America, but I think there's a lot of countries out there that are, are doing their best is what I say. And I think that's what America does. We do our best, right? We're a democracy that does our best in France and Greece and a lot of the other places we visit, visited were kind of the same deal. It wasn't, wasn't a bunch of people that had views any different than us in America. They want to raise their kids. They want to make money. They want to have fun. And um, it just broadened everything for me. And I, I lived in Europe prior to that playing with NFL Europe. But when you're playing for the NFL, you're protected. They don't let you out into the world, you know. Uh, and we were obviously we were not protected. It was just us. You kind of got on a motor scooter or in a tuk tuk and went and you saw the, saw the world. And um, it, there's no amount. Really, there is no amount of money that can equal the experience that we had. Yeah, and one of the things that I don't think people are aware of, right, is how long the wheels take to turn in the entertainment industry. Like they put out, uh, you know, the writers write a script for a, a TV pilot. By the time that they get it approved, they do rewrites, they send it to a casting director, they send it out, they see people, they audition, um, they get it, they film it, they cut it, it goes to post from the time that the idea was created in the writer's room to the time you're actually seeing it is at least six, seven, eight months. It's a long time away in terms of how the lead time. So it is a really frustrating process. Um, the, you know, when we were first filming the show, right? Like we filmed a few episodes before we ever had traction. I know the history channel wanted to take the, the network in a different direction away from like the mom and pop, World War II documentaries that up until then they were really known for. The only other show that the History Channel had that was their other flagship show was the Ice Road Truckers. 
um, yeah. which I always had a love hate with because it was a good show, but it was always the show that we were competing with for the number one slot. So I was always like, <laughs> you know, get like a little bit of me was like, ah, oh, this is a wonderful show, but I kind of hope they stop making it. But, but uh, it was a cool show. So it was always like us and ice road truckers. But for a while there, like there was no, we're just going out and we're like, it feels like we're making home videos because nobody really knows what the fuck the show is, what it should look like. Um, you know, the, and our days were so long in the beginning because they had to get so much footage and stuff. We were working 15, 16 hours, you know, like running around and, and doing shit but what was the first time that like when the first show first aired what was the first reaction that like from outside of your family that you got from like either a friend that watched it or someone that noticed the show um what was that like i got an immense amount of text messages from guys i played football with so that was the first like it was basically like most of them were like what the hell are you doing because <laughs> checking your sanity Right. I didn't tell anybody. You know, I just I figured, hey, this could this could be a complete waste of my time. I, I didn't I didn't honestly I didn't know what to expect. And then um, they kept saying, you know, it, they kept saying the air date is this, the air date is that pushed it back like three or four times. If my memory is correct. Did they? I don't remember. Yeah. I, I just remember, uh, you know, Zach, who was one of the producers saying, hey, it's going to air on this date. Oh, no, it's going to air on this date. And then finally, when they picked a date. And then put it on all the billboards and all that kind of stuff. I already already told a couple of people like two or three different dates. So at that point, I had just stopped. I stopped telling people I, until it was like hardcore on the guide for television. And then I, I just put it out there. Hey, make sure you check this out. The guide. So then all my, the, the TV yeah. guide. Oh, that's a throwback. There's only like <laughs> what like like fifteen to thirty percent of the population that still has TV guides somewhere in their home. Yeah, I think I showed my age on that one. <laughs> Everyone likes. Yeah, but any, the, the football guys thought I was nuts because um, football guys and, and fighting it's 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 almost taboo, right? Because when you get into a fight in football, everyone has their helmets and their pads on. It's known that it's going to be broken up before anything happens. It's kind of all for show. But the fighting that we were doing was, I mean, people were coming up and punching us in the face. Yeah. So, well, that was the crazy thing, right? Like in the beginning is, you know, so the history channel build this, I think they took the easy route, which was, Hey, we're going to make this exotic locations and Hey, our guys are going to fight to the death. <laughs> That's effectively what they wanted you to believe every episode, right. each episode, Bill or Jason will perish. Like, and it's, it's hard to have that sustainability. Right. But from, if you've ever really trained or done martial arts or sports at a high level, you know, you really can't, first of all, it, it, let's just call a spade a spade, right? Like it's ridiculous to think that anyone in their right mind could go to a, a, a foreign country. And even if you have the best training, even if you were training 10 hours a day, which we weren't, we were training a good 45 minutes a day. Everything else is driving, setting up, looking at the shots. It's like football, right? Like there's like seven and a half minutes of actual football. We actually probably had 45 minutes of actual training every, every day, but like you can't really get that great. Right? So for them to think we're going to have a real, fight and that's how they wanted to build a danger aspect of this at the end of the episodes was challenging because we always had to figure out how do we dial it in enough where this isn't we're playing patty cake and then not where the point where one of us gets injured which obviously happens and did happen to us and then we got to fly the next day to another country and start this whole process all over again were you right. uh, were you concerned at all about uh getting injuries going into the show because my big concern before the first episode was like, are we legitimately supposed to like really fight or are we, what's the, there was no medical doctors. I mean, we were in the middle of the jungle in Thailand and like I was the closest thing to an MD <laughs> and that's a far cry from an MD. Yeah, I was, you know what? I was just as concerned as you were because I came from a world where there were doctors and trainers and you got hurt and the ice was right there. So I, I knew what I'd signed up for, but, on the same note, like we went into these fights, not even knowing what the other guy was thinking. I remember going into the pancreation fight and the guy was like smiling at me before the fight and shook my hand like 10 times. And, you know, I go out there, I'm like, Oh, this is going to be friendly. I kind of dropped my hands a little bit and he kicked me right in my face. Like first thing I was like, okay, I guess we're fighting, <laughs> uh... you know? And it was each fight that I had, and I'm sure you felt the same way was almost like, I was waiting for them to show me what level we were at. And then when I understood then I would try to match that level. And it, it was disastrous in some instances and it worked out in others. Um, but I just, 
he just didn't know what to expect. And most of the guys didn't speak English. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing, right? Like we go to like the first few episodes, they initially had it where the, the master was going to pick which one of us fought. I mean, they had no real parameters on how are they going to decide that. But like the average Southeast Asian is five foot four, maybe 135 maybe. pounds. You yeah. know, I'm, I at the time was about 175 at six feet and I looked like fucking Mount Fuji. And then they look at Bill <laughs> who looks like one of these poor Filipino cats could have hopped inside of you and used you as like fucking an animatronic robot, like a meat suit. <laughs> like, yeah. like for the first like four episodes, they were just like, uh, in sync is fighting. Uh, like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah we gotta do something about this. This is going to be uh, sponsored by ibuprofen. Well, and that I think that part of it was learning on the fly. I don't really blame anyone. I don't blame the producers or because I think we were building uh, we were building a show really, like building it from scratch. And I remember a lot of times saying no. Now, I don't know how many times you did, but like when I had that, I had some sort of bacteria all over my arm that I got in Thailand. And then in the Philippines, they wanted me to rub like boiling oil all over. You remember that? Oh yeah, I did that. We just sort yeah, of jumped through the fire. I remember yeah. they didn't really have actual like ceremonies set up at a lot of these places, so um, they had to basically make a ceremony. We go to like, remember the ninjutsu episode? They were like, "This is a ninja obstacle course," but really it was like a children's playground that just had some monkey bars and shit. And like they tried to film around ropes courses as if this was like a legitimate ninja school where you went to learn to be a ninja. No. No, this was like, like the, the, the kids play, like we were like on, we're, now we're walking the plank. No, it's a teeter totter, man. Like, come on. Yeah. How stupid do you think the audience is? Chill out. Um, but it's the same thing. We did the, the boiling water. That was like a carnival or some school fair. And they tried to make it look so <laughs> intimidating. But I do, I remember refusing to do that. And then one of our producers, Brian, who was a young guy, came up to me and my wife was with me at the time she had traveled over and, um, He's like, come on, man, you got to do this. Like, I, you know, we need you to do this. And I just looked up at him and I said, no, I'm not doing it. And he started crying. And <laughs> even my wife, even my wife was like, you're crying. And I was like, dude, you just need to like, go, you know, like, go over there and gather yourself. Um, <laughs> but I didn't think it was that serious since you had already agreed to do it. We had a guy on film putting boiling oil on his chest. You're, yeah. you're all set. Yeah. He was young. I, that producer, he was like 24 or something. I think he was younger yeah, than he I was. I like, was 27, 28, or 28. I mean, super nice kid, but when some when a 300 pound man tells you no, he means no. Yeah, no means no, especially when it comes yeah. from a 300 pound silverback gorilla. That's funny. Yeah, I mean, I think that like it was a very surreal experience because for whatever level of shitty D fame, like you know, we achieved with that show. Like, you don't really notice you, until you do. I remember being in a movie theater and it was so trippy because like before the movie, there was like some trailer. It was that trailer we filmed in New York for like the pump of like our show. And they had that, that weird song playing and like slow motion, us getting our asses kicked and like blood yeah. splattering out and stuff. And I was like, that's pretty cool. That was pretty neat. I should have been that on the first date. That would have been like an instant closer, right? Like, oh, that's... <laughs> Does that guy look familiar? No, not the bald guy, the other guy. <laughs> what was your biggest takeaway, Chase? Um, man, that's a tough one. I think that like my biggest takeaway was probably the martial arts aspect of it. Because can we just be honest for a second? Like, so many martial arts are just complete bullshit nowadays. You know, they don't have you know, our show, and I had this drilled into our head, right, was to explore the history and culture of the various martial arts and the cultures and the people, you know, it was so like scripted, right, with here's what you got to say. And, and I respect martial arts for different reasons. But the problem and the analogy I always give is like, if you like I was I got into martial arts because I got picked on and beat up as a kid. And like, you know, like those bullies, like I hated going to school because like those dudes are like one would watch the door, the other one like be beating the shit out of me. And I was little and these dudes are like the ones who went through puberty at 12 years old. And I'm like with gangs and shit. So I get into martial arts. And like the problem is if you know you can't fight and then you go take karate, 
Well, now you now have a false sense of I can fight because some <laughs> shit that we did together for nine minutes and we did this routine and I broke a fucking, uh, you know, a wood board and now I got a purple belt or a green belt. Now I think I can fight. Now you have a false sense of security, which before I had to develop wit. But if I was into karate, I then would got my ass kicked more because I'm like, oh, I know some karate because that's just linear, right? Like mo karate, in a lot of these martial arts, they're just kind of, um, you know, like they're, they're, not the ones better than another, but in terms of real world practicality, there are like, okay, they're, they're better. I, I'm not going to mince words, man. Like Muay Thai is better than karate. Like karate sucks. Like karate is not a great martial art. <laughs> like, let's be honest in terms of like well, for, real for, world. For that's fighting, one of the things, I yeah. yeah, that's one fighting, of the things that, I like I, I really took away was the Krav Maga episode because Krav Maga here in the U S it, it's like, it's pretty mediocre at best, but in, in Israel, I mean, there's what, 7 million people surrounded by 41 million people that just, you know, they all hate them. And like, they're constantly at war. That's like, they have to not only think about how do they real world situational and practically defend themselves, but likely their family, their friends, and they're dealing with these chaotic situations. So they had a very, a very good, um, like the way they looked at it in terms of like mindset versus like, here's a bunch of linear moves that are important. Yeah, I remember those guys, uh, the bodyguards, when I got up at the sushi place in Israel to go to the bathroom and like two of the guys stood up to go with me. I'm like, I think I think I got the bathroom covered. guys. <laughs> but that like you know, that's their mentality. They were told to protect us and I, they didn't care where we went. They were going to protect us, which I thought was really cool. I really did. Yeah, that was fun. You know, I was surprised with all the flights that no one ever missed a connection. We had like an infinite amount of flights and especially coming, yeah. you know, for you, you were going East Coast to the Midwest, to the California, to over to Japan. I mean, some of the times we'd be flying 20, 30 hours to get to a destination. And then it's like wake up the next morning at 5 a.m. because we're going to go drive, you know, 600 kilometers and go swim with leeches because that'll teach you how to center your chi. Right. Yeah, that, those were my favorite mornings. What was your Actually, favorite my episode? favorite morning was when I had to break up our director, Patrick Lee Bell, and our head camera guy, um, Foster. What was his first name? It's Brian? No. No. Not, uh, oh, I'm so bad with names. Uh, Eric? I know his last name. No, Eric Futrell and Eric Futrell. Foster. Uh, well, regardless, he's a great guy. But they were going to fist fight right there in front of the hotel in Tel Aviv because Pat told our camera guy that he was a coward for not wanting to go film at, um, what was it? Ramallah? I think or... it was the, um, Gaza strip. Oh, the Gaza strip. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they were like bombing people in the Gaza strip at the time. Yeah, this was, was like, like a CNN reporter just got kidnapped like the week prior. And this crazy Paul. Uh, director. His name was Paul. 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 That's it. Yeah. Paul. But Paul was going to whoop his ass. I probably should have let him whoop his ass, but I didn't think it was good for production at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because then we would have just gotten stuck there while they figured out where to get new cameras. And uh, we would have been stuck. Oh, I guess if you're going to get stuck somewhere, Israel's pretty pretty awesome. Like, I, I liked Israel. I went out a couple times to like this club that was, um, I don't know, maybe like a half a mile down. And um, I got there at like 1230. And I was like, oh shit, this is going to be late. We had to be up at like 6 a.m. And like the guy's like, yeah, nobody comes till. 2 a.m. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> How late do my Hebrew brothers and sisters party? Like, holy shit. So sure enough, like I'm just kind of killing time walking around there. 2 a.m. comes, starts piling in. So the next day, like I didn't sleep. Like I was just like went to the lobby. I think I like wandered into the hotel at like 5:45. And I'm like, Bill, you gotta take today. You gotta be the man. <laughs> I today. remember that. I, I can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm so hungover. <laughs> so it, like that's a little e that'd be e fun uh episode we just watch all the episodes back to back and just go through easter eggs like well here i'm absolutely fucked up and then here we didn't really break that that guy bro that, that's uh that's the, the the fun behind the scenes like when like we did the remember, Greece uh, with the with the uh tiles oh yeah <laughs> that was a funny story do you remember that story i do it was bill's but time I, to fight i also remember I remember Patrick pulling me aside after that um, lobby. And he's like, he's like, Bill, we have to do something about Jason. Like, what are we going to do about Jason? Because he's South African, had that accent. And I go, I don't know what you're going to do about him, but I'll be in the van. <laughs> <laughs> what was that from? 
like, you had stayed out like partying or something. And I, oh. I honestly, I, I didn't care. Yeah. yeah. I was like, he's here. Like, let's go. Yeah. I don't see what the problem is. Yeah, there's been like once or twice that I can remember on the show that uh, I made some poor decisions in terms of my uh, my overestimating my ability to function on a lack of sleep. <laughs> so, anytime you just watch the show and you just see me like this in the background, just kind of just closing my eyes. <laughs> I, just, I don't remember what was going on. You know when you're so tired, it feels like you're drunk and it's almost kind of fun again? Yeah. You've been awake for so yeah. long. Yeah, but it, in a foreign country, after traveling, you know, God knows how many hours, you must have just been. You must have felt awful. Oh yeah, no, there was never like uh, a time that I was like w- waking up at like five a.m. like bright eyed and bushy tailed. Like, oh, how far no. did we get to drive today? But you know, it's a, that's me really being super hypercritical because at the end of the day, like how lucky, right? Like we got to travel the world on someone else's oh, yeah. and make a few bucks and see all these awesome martial arts and karate yeah well karate was interesting to me because the breakdown they gave me before the fight was not how the fight went at all you know they were like all right you know you guys are going to go out there you're going to have some hard sparring you know no one's going to do anything crazy and we'll you know we'll they'll call it however they call it because let's be honest the judges were going to pick them you know 90 percent of the time if if they did good uh, and I didn't care. I just wanted to survive. But then I go out there and, you know, the guy kicked me in my kneecap three times. You know, everyone asked me why I punched him in the face. I punched him in the face after the third kneecap kick. I remember that I, episode. You had bloody yeah, knuckles. it's like, dude, you kicked me in my kneecap again. And I, I was ready to just pick him up and pile drop at that point. That was always my default. Like, luckily, 94% of the episodes we filmed were striking martial arts. And I was always, like, dialed in the back of my head, like, well, if this gets crazy out of control, I am not ethically opposed to shooting a double leg. Like, Savat or something. The only episode If you I was, remember, I did that in Cambodia, and they never aired it. A double leg? <laughs> no, I, I picked the guy up, bear hugged the little guy, and slammed him. Remember that night fight thing they set up in Cambodia? And we were in the middle of a village and there's flies everywhere and all that. And they were like, all right, you know, Bill, you're going to jump in the ring versus this little guy. And you guys are just going to do some light sparring for the background stuff. It'll be the open of the show. I'm like, all right, cool. So jump in there. I had no warm up. I didn't stretch. It was just supposed to be go out and the dude just belts me in the side of the face. And I'm like, what the hell? Okay, and I'm like, yes. and even with my gloves, I'm like, calm down, dude. Like, this is for TV. I go back in, he hit me with another one. And I just wrapped him up, picked him up, and slammed him. And I hit him. And I remember because you jump in the ring, and it was like a professional wrestle match had just started. This entire the entire crowd is going crazy. Like I thought they were gonna jump in the ring and start beating my ass. So I'm ready, like I'm ready for anything. And for some some somehow we got out of there without me being stabbed by spears. I'm still amazed by it. Um, but it was just, I, I, I don't think I've ever told that story before, actually. <laughs> like, I feel like there was probably some lost in translation moments that were also exacerbated by, um, the fact that like one of our production crew was just a dick and he was probably like, Hey, um, so go easy on these local Cambodians. And then they're telling the Cambodians, please knock out our hosts. <laughs> like they were probably yeah. putting bounties on our heads. If, if they were yeah. smart, they were like, Hey, uh, you knock out the big guy. Here's 500. You knock out the little guy. Here's 250. You knock a bolt out. You get a grand. That's probably, they probably had like so many bounties on our heads for like these, these matches. Cause you can never kind of figure out, like it's hard to dial in at the same level. Right. And like, then you don't want to be the 300 pound American. Who's just, pawing at some like 117 pound like cambodian kid who's getting like eight dollars in the bag of rice for this fight you know it's like, <laughs> right that was always in the back of my head like what happens if i hurt this kid or you know and he can't go to work tomorrow you know and and it's a legitimate concern for a guy my size i could just fall on him yeah you're like wrecking it off. yeah <laughs> and you know i took a lot of heat um a lot of heat online for that i remember people saying like yeah, you know, oh, he's, you know, he's just using his size and then he doesn't know what he's doing. And, I, I'm, and I, I wanted to be like, people, don't you realize, like, these are real human beings that we're in there with in a third world country that literally are going out to the rice paddies tomorrow morning to work. Like, we're not going to clothesline them and, and destroy them. It's just, 
it's irresponsible and stupid. But. I mean, I kind of want to see a clothesline in real person. <laughs> like, I think <laughs> that's the one wrestling move that I would love to see actually happen in a bar fight. Like, well, he did get clotheslined. <laughs> like, you could never talk shit again if you're the guy that got no. clotheslined in a bar. <laughs> yeah, I, I've never seen it myself. I've seen it plenty in pro wrestling. But uh, is that an avenue you ever thought about going? Was like pro wrestling? A lot of MMA guys retire and they kind of get into that, like the theatrics of it. And you're a big guy. Was that ever crossed your mind? Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. You look different. Why do you have pictures of random bald guys on your computer? Was that you? Was that me? (laughs) I apologize. Um, What was the question, Jason? I, oh, no, I was asking, um, oh, my gosh, what was the question? That's horrible. That's what happens when you get punched in the head repeatedly. A- yes. Anybody for 500 points what the question was? <laughs> well, like nobody was listening. And they put the headset down like an hour ago. They're like, we're smoking weed. And this is you guys talk, whatever. Um, yeah, I don't uh, I don't recall. Uh, we were talking about putting oh, bounties pro, on our I'm heads. Sorry. Oh, wrestling. Yeah, yes. Pro, pro wrestling. Yeah. So have you ever no. thought about getting into pro wrestling? I actually went through the monster factory. So my first pro team was uh, the Phil, or the 49ers. And then I was the last guy cut on the last day of cuts. And oh. I was cut for, for a guy who was in the training room, hurt the entire camp. Now you want to talk about an awful way to get cut. It, it just was it like, it broke my heart. Um, so then I went to Woodbury, New Jersey. I went to a guy uh, named pretty boy, Larry Sharp. He was not pretty uh, great guy. But it was called the Monster Factory, and a bunch of guys like Bam Bam Bigelow, King Kong Bundy, um, Paul White, who's the new giant, they all came out of there. So I was training with them for a while. I started wrestling independent shows. I did about three or four shows, and then I had a meeting with JR uh, over at the Spectrum, the Philadelphia Spectrum, because WWF at the time was coming through. It's WWE now. So I go over, I meet with JR, and he's like, all right, you know, we can send you down to our development league in Kentucky or Florida. But we love your size. We love what you're all about. Um, so, you know, l- let me talk to Vince and we'll get back to you. And I'm like, great. You know, my career is getting ready to take off. The next morning, Dwight Clark from the Cleveland Browns called me and offered me a, a contract with the Browns. So I literally, I had. Pro so this was pre-human or, weapon. This is pre-human Right weapon. out of college? Right out of college, yeah. Okay. So I had the choice. I was like, should I stay with wrestling? Or should I go to football? And I reached out to a couple of people, um, just picked their brain. Ted DiBiase was one of them. Oh, Ted and, DiBiase, uh, the million dollar man. Yeah. I used to yeah. love being and his then, character in the WWE game. Yeah. Ultimately, it was JR. He's like, hey, Duff, you know, you can you can always come back to wrestling. You know, just go play football and, and you know, see where that lands and see how that takes you. And I listened to him. I thank God that I listened to him. Because I played for a couple of years with the Browns, a couple of years in Europe, the XFL, where I ran into Jr. again and uh, caught up with him. It was it was really cool. It was like a, a full circle moment in my life. And then, um, you know, after I had finally gotten hurt uh, to where I couldn't play football anymore or shouldn't play football anymore, I, I was just at an age where pro wrestling was not even in my my viewpoint anymore. Because I had had the guys who I kind of came in with. They were either addicted to drugs, dead, or on their way to one of the two. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's the road I want to take. Speaking of addicted to drugs, like one of the things I'm super passionate about is there's so many guys in the MMA community and, and, and um, <clears throat> that that are just adamantly opposed, or the BJJ community, but really MMA community, opposed to taking like drugs recreationally. I'm not talking weed. I mean, like painkillers or anything like that. And then they get these injuries. And then because of those injuries, they start taking pain pills and more pain pills. And sooner than later, like their careers are cut short. The talent goes downhill and they're addicted to these pain pills and the opiates. Um, Was that how big of a problem was that in the NFL and in like pro wrestling? Massive. It's massive. It's uh, do they have any resources for the NFL for that? They do, but it's the moniker of being the big tough guy, the football player, your entire life, you know, you're told to get up, get off the turf, brush yourself off, go back out there. And unfortunately, um, even within the last week, uh, lost, a, a, a what I call a football brother to suicide. And, um, 
month prior lost another brother to suicide. Suicide is so prevalent within the ex football player community, not just professional, but college. Why is that? And it's like, the, it's just this dirty little secret um, that nobody's willing to talk about. I'm willing to talk about it. It's, it's the inability to seek help because you think you're not supposed to, because you're this big tough guy, right? You're mm -hmm. like, you are for, for, for no other uh, term, like a human weapon, right? You're this human weapon, but you're not, you're just a person. Right, your bones send you mostly water, and you have the same brain, but you you destroyed it basically. You slammed it into things your entire life, so you need you need help. And um, I've always told any of my friends, you need help, reach out. I'm there for you, whatever you need. But that's the that's the thing. The old football players, the old MMA guys, the old uh, pro wrestlers, they won't reach out for help. They just won't. It's not in their blood. That's the one thing, like, I can say, like, I, or maybe it's just through the pandemic, but I feel like there's been a, a, an awareness of a few things. Like, um, this cancel culture is crazy, right? But aside from that, like, um, like mental health has really been in the spotlight more over the last few years. Like, at least I've seen it, right? Because I, I, I think that, like, maybe we come from the last generation of um, those guys, like, you know, get up, Mick, you know, like, it's, and now it's like, I mean, I think there has to be a balance, right? Because I think in some, on some levels, we risk over pussifying America. And I think we kind of have overcorrected on some of this. Now it's like, you know, like, guys won't make comedies anymore because, uh, like, director of, uh, what's that, won't make comedies anymore. Um, because you're like, you offend everybody. You just can't make a comedy. But on the same token, like, I think that, like, whether you're a fighter or athlete, it's hard for guys that, like, you know, when you're an athlete at that highest level, you're, you know, you're, you're dedicating and sacrificing so much. And there's so much machismo and competition innate to those sports that, like, it's looked at as a weakness up until recently. Like, oh, you need help. You, 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 you know, you're on painkillers. Oh, bro, you need help. You but I've seen, man, like so many friends, just their careers get cut short. They're just different fighters. I just had a friend that was a really good friend of mine die uh, that was like the nicest guy in the world and ended up becoming homeless. Like the typical, sadly, the typical like story about that. And that's one of the things I really think like there needs to be a, like some sort of an outreach or like because it's one thing I think if you go out there and you make a conscious decision, hey, I'm going to go buy heroin because I want to get fucked up. You want to do that? that's your life right but when these guys are only addicted to pills because of an injury for the sacrifice of their sport i feel like whoever benefited from their hard work and determination whether it's the ufc or the you know the nfl there need to be some um reciprocation in terms of like looking out for the long-term health of these guys yeah it's the problem is you pick up the phone and you call one of these uh, things that like the nfl set up and on the other end of the phone is some guy who's never played football, never fought. He's never done any of the things, you know, destructive to their body like we did. And um, they, I, it, there's almost this, this thought in your head or this knowing that, you know, they don't understand what you're going through. Like there's no way they could unless they were one of us. And like my father always said, don't ever, ever, get carted off the field no matter what you stand up and you get off that field and that always stuck in my head and there were a couple moments in college and in professional football where I was really I was hurt I was injured and I got up just because that always stuck in my head that you know my father told me no matter what walk off that field and that's the mentality that made me who I am today but also made guys like me and you uh, a lot less likely to take help, much less. Likely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm stupid in that capacity. In my, I, I'm a walking, um, just my body's abysmal. But my knee, like on the on the Taekwondo episode, I snapped my ACL, and like, and that was 2008. Here we are, 2021. I still haven't had surgery. I keep pushing it back because I don't want that downtime of like, oh, I got to freaking be on crutches and shit. You know, it's just so, it's so easy to push off like that's that 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 um self-care when you're not like you don't have a reason like i'm not fighting anymore i don't have anything kind of that i've got to go out there and, and, and get done but like circling back to the uh the football stuff you know one of the things i always wondered like when you played for like d1 school with like peyton manning in the locker room i mean everyone probably has that ambition right like hey we made it this far through those sacrifices and dedication um does everybody feel like they got a good chance of going pro is that the pipe dream or is that like well i guess when you know you got 50 guys in the locker room with peyton manning everyone's kind of got to know, all right, Peyton, this guy's, he's, he's going to be in the big leagues. What's that, what's that like vibe like in the locker rooms? Well, a couple things happen when you first go D1. 
uh, a group comes in of about 20 to 25 guys under scholarship and about half of them realize right away, I'm not going pro. At best, I may play, you know, special teams or be a second teamer on this team. Um, and, a, and a good healthy amount of them transfer within the first year. Uh, and then so like these two the or just other D one schools that aren't as competitive. Uh, yeah, they'll go to like a, uh, at the time they used to go to like nickel state or Appalachian state, Appalachian state's really good now, but, yeah, um, th that used to be like the transfer use Delaware, okay. um, Townsend, uh, it, but just places where they could play and, and, and be successful starting, but not a Tennessee or Alabama or Florida, you know, the monsters, because when you get there, if you're not that premier level athlete, if you're not there, you have no chance. You just have no shot. Because Christ, at 285 pounds coming out as a senior, I ran a 4.65, wow. 40. I mean, that is smoking. And I was the slowest guy on the defense. Oops. There you are again. I'm sorry. Is That's that, Thanos. Is that, who is that? Thanos. Thanos? Yeah. Is that your I, I have cook? Some, I have a very weird Thanos obsession. That's, that's, go, pull that up again. I, well, hold on. I'll do, I'll do better. Oh, Bill's going to show us his comic book collection. No, I'll, I'll bring over my latest. I see Thanos in the back wall too. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. One Can of you my just pause like things. that for a second? Just give me the left arm bicep. Yeah, the left. That's very similar. <laughs> very similar. You look the, uh, they're, they're pulling up Bill Goldberg. And uh, so right now my, my production's put on Bill Goldberg on a bunch of um, images. And I think they're trying to reference the fact that you look like him. You've never heard that, I'm assuming. I've heard that a lot, <laughs> but I always say I'm Bill Goldberg with a lot of hoagies. <laughs> you know what you should just do? Just spend a day saying you're Bill Goldberg and just ruin his reputation. Just everyone will be like, God, Bill Dover is such an ass. God, he's mean. He pushed a crippled lady over, and then stole her wallet purse. I guess she'd have a purse. I don't know. Maybe I, I should I can't to drop about 50 pounds to, to actually look like him now. He was huge back in the day. Just in terms yeah, of I look more time. like I look more like the Kingpin now than Bill Goldberg. Uh, they're making a Kingpin, are they? Are they they're doing something uh, like that, I think. He is supposed to show up in the new Spider Man. Okay. Who's playing yeah. him? Vincent D'Onofrio. I have no idea who that is. Yes, you do. From the cell, uh, excellent actor. He was in. Uh, he was that bad guy, the bug guy from um, Men in Black. Uh, okay, it's funny when you yeah. see the bug guy. I instantly know who that is. Yeah, when he's like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The main, the main <laughs> guy with a roach is yeah. in, from the other planet. Yeah, that's funny, man. So the, uh, you know, like one of the things I've always told people is that like people are asking like, well, how come you guys didn't do more episodes? And I'm like, well, cause you and your friends didn't watch enough. No. Um, <laughs> but like legitimately I thought up until really while we were filming the last episode, like we had talks about doing a bunch more and, um, you know, it would have been cool when, like, when did you have that realization? Like, Oh shit. <laughs> uh, kind of, believe it or not in Malaysia. So when we were in Malaysia, which is the last episode we taped, me and my wife went to Lankawa Island for vac vacation right after, and she found out she was pregnant, or we were pregnant. And she gave me this look. I still remember it to this day, and I still tell people, and I call it the you're done look. And she was, you know, getting ready to have a baby, and she, I think it, we had gotten to the point where she was done watching me get hit in the head knocked around going around and she just wanted like a regular husband um so whether we did any more after that or not i was gonna have, i was gonna have a major decision ahead of me to be honest with you um if if they said they wanted to do more because uh i just i don't think she was gonna hang in there for much more <laughs> there's only so much you can watch somebody you love get get beat up and thrown around and injured and all that stuff and still be okay you Those know she, she did put up good money for that <laughs> yeah right <laughs> some people not us was malaysia the last episode i thought that uh was malaysia the very last one or was um the the, the taekwondo one uh either or I, I don't remember but i do remember that look 
that look. No. Like, I don't yeah. remember what country I was in, but boy, do I remember the look my wife gave me. <laughs> well, if I'm being honest, I do. I have some memory issues um, because I remember getting hit in the head with a sword when we did ninjutsu, and I it basically gave me a concussion. And then right after that, we went to Korea, and we told that guy who I was fighting, hey, you know, he got hit in the head with a base, basically a baseball bat, like three weeks ago, you know, make it look really good, but please don't hit him in the head. And of course, what's the guy do? He kicks me right in the head, knocks me clean out. And I honestly, I don't remember much of that Korean episode that we did. I don't remember a lot of the jiu-jitsu episode we did because my brain was just smashed. Yeah. Is that from a lot of uh, accumulation from like years of playing football? Of course. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've been through the whole concussion protocol and all that. And uh, the, the good thing is it helped me. And that's what I tell a lot of guys that I didn't know what I didn't know. So now I have, um, you know, resources and some medications that really, really do help me. So I'm an advocate of going to the neurologist and neuropsychologist and all that. You should go. If you have any question, if you have any memory lapses, you should absolutely go. Um, but it's also scary, right? Because it's that mentality we just talked about. Like, I'm tough. I don't need a doctor. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I got over that. Well, I think, like, the spotlight has been on football for the last few years in terms of, like, injuries and, and brain injuries and stuff. Um, and I think that one of the things that I've seen just as a very casual, albeit diehard Bears fan, is that every year it seems like they're implementing more and more rules to make the game safer. And I think there's really two camps that people fall in. And some people are following the whole like, ah, I miss that that rough and tough 80s football where you could just drive a hole through the quarterback's heart and you tried to kill him. And now it's like no helmet to helmet. You can't do this. You can't do that. W what side of the fence do you fall on? Do you look at the you miss the my dad yelling at me, get up, get off the field and that that gritty football or do you feel like the uh the, the safer football is better football i think it's time for the gladiators to go away to die i think they had their time now now when people clap when someone else gets hurt i i say that's somebody's kid that's somebody's dad and that's somebody's son and you need to think about what you're clapping for right now it really it upsets me to the point sometimes of rage when i see people clapping when another athlete not just in football let's say an MMA gets injured. I can't stand that. That guy worked for three months to get into a ring to put everything he had on the line for 6,000 bucks. And he broke his arm and you're laughing, you know, screw you. Honestly, screw you. That's just how I feel. So safer you err on the side. Yeah. Of safer. I, like, el like elbows and MMA. I still don't understand elbows and MMA. Yeah. Well, the only thing out of it does MMA. The 12 to 6 it hurts stuff. guys it cuts guys it's not good for the sport it's not good for people and it should be taken away but yeah, uh, i wasn't a, i wasn't a big fan of the elbows either uh, kenny florian really did a great job of like utilizing elbows back in the day and um you know with uh, cutting guys open but the 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 from a safety point of view, but also like premature cuts used to stop a lot of MMA fights. So there was a de definitely a production point of view that they didn't like to that is huge fight built up. And then it's like, Oh, I just sliced over your eye. And now we got to call the fight that happened on a, a few occasions. But, but yeah, I think right. it's, um, I think it's good, you know, cause every 20 years you can look back at athletes and the athletes playing today are just so much better, faster, bigger, stronger than the guys playing 20 years prior and 20 years prior. And like, absolutely making the safe sport or making the sport safe doesn't necessarily have to equate to it being a less entertaining sport. Cause I mean, like we have great camera angles, we have a whole lot of more stats, more, you know, fan interaction and stuff like that. And I think that that's, you know, like as MMA evolved, I mean, look at I me, mean, MMA was human cockfighting at one point, you know, like such the underground sport that nobody was like, come on, you can, you, if you ever go back and everyone that has watched like UFCs nowadays and you go back and watch UFC one, it is a completely different sport. I mean, there's no rules, no weight classes, no time limits. Like any athlete in the UFC today, any any one of them could have won UFC one through probably 15, you know, until like you had like the Randy Couture's and stuff start coming in. So um, right. safety is a safety is a good thing. And I would think I hope that like, you know, that athletes all over the place, you know, between the things you've played, right? You've done football, you've done wrestling, you've uh, pursued the, the entertainment uh, industry. If you had a boy that was 13, which and he was like i have an interest in all of these which road do you steer him towards and why i would steer him towards education first 
But if I had to choose any one of those, I'd probably choose martial arts because if he's not a, a phenomenal athlete, at least it gives him dedication. It gives him discipline. Um, and I do teach my daughters martial arts. I, you know, I don't raise victims. Um, so I don't think I, the good thing about martial arts is it's not just for professional athletics. It's to teach you lessons in life and to get you prepared for life. Like you took martial arts for that reason. I'm sorry. That's a third time's charm. Um, and so do I, but I, I do have a meeting. I got to run to Jay. All right. Man. Um, what's so where are I you will, now? Uh, you, uh, you, you're so like, you're a Northeast hustling the casino Northeast, working for the casinos, working for bed MGM, getting people to give me lots of money to bet. <laughs> Got any betting tips that are, that are, um, evergreen, like always bet. On if black. you want to make money <laughs> with casinos, work for a casino. That's brilliant. We should just yeah. end it with that. That should be in your business card. No, I just <laughs> tell you because you're my friend. <laughs> I appreciate it. No one else will ever hear that. I promise. <laughs> Thanks, man, for coming on. Always good talking, right. to you, man, and catching up. And um, you're going to be down here in Florida soon, right? I'll be down there in November. November. Cruise. Beautiful. Next, cool, no, next November. <laughs> oh. oh, never mind. Or no, February. 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 There, see, there's that brain damage. <laughs> Send me a text. <laughs> okay. All right, man. Good talking to you. <laughs> See you, bro.